Media and Technology Lecture Series hosted by uh, Northeastern's Media Studios organization. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator, Doug Bielmeyer, and our host for today, uh, Rob Jasko, and I'll let Doug uh, take it from here. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, first of all, to Kelly and uh, the Media Services offices uh, for uh, putting this all together. Um, there's, it's been a great lecture series so far, and I think today is going to be really exciting. Uh, I know I invited a bunch of students from some of my recording courses this summer uh, because they heard Rob Jasko, the one and only uh, Rob Jasko, would be uh, talking about mixing and talking about eliciting emotions. Um, and I think it's a really great topic, um, especially dealing with humanics and dealing with sort of the the intangible things that humans can offer into any sort of technology situation. So if you don't already know Rob, let me introduce him. Let me a proper read his um, uh, short bio here. Um, uh, Rob has been an independent recording engineer and recording producer. Uh, he was formerly a staff engineer at AM, a m Studios in Hollywood, California. His recording credits include and here, I'll take a deep breath because it's quite a long list. Uh -oh. uh, Cheryl Crow, Don Henley, Hall & Oates, Graham Nash, Bruce Springsteen, James Taylor, Ron Wood, Warren Zevon, and many others. Uh, Rob is currently the chair of the Music Production uh, and Engineering Department at Berklee College of Music. Uh, Rob is also a frequent lecturer and clinician at the Panama Jazz Festival, uh, Panama City, Panama. Uh, his other lecturing engagements include the International College of Music at Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur, KL. Uh, and uh, Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation event, Signal or Noise, um, the future of music on the net. Uh, Rob is also the founder of ViewWorks, a content and technology provider for stereoscopic 3D imaging. Um, Rob, it's, it's amazing to have you here today. I know a lot of the students were really excited, um, and I know uh, everyone in attendance today, it looks like we already have a really great turnout. So no one came here to hear me talk. So <laughs> let, let me turn it over to you, Rob. And once again, thanks so much for coming, and we're excited to uh, hear what you have for us today. Well, well, thank you very much, Doug, for the introduction. I really appreciate it, and thanks to uh Kelly Zona and Rich Corin for reaching out to me in the first place. Uh, the idea of humanics is something that, uh, uh, frankly, I'd not heard the term before, but once we started to talk it down, uh, I summarized it as an intersection between uh, art and science, really, humans and, and technology. And uh, I think that it was very easy for me to come up with a concept of demonstrating uh, how we actually uh, intentionally set out to create emotions when we uh, mix a recording and uh, any kind of music project in fact uh, is a prime candidate for uh, eliciting emotion and I think out of all the senses out of all the art forms music is the one that uh, absolutely can make you melancholy it can make you angry you can remember your eighth grade boyfriend or girlfriend for better for worse uh, any number of emotions can be triggered instantaneously by hearing the first note of music. And I think that's a really powerful, uh, powerful uh, concept and a powerful tool that we have. And yet behind the scenes as, as music makers, music creators, engineers, producers, and others that participate in the process, there are some technicalities. There are some tools, I would say tricks of the trade, but it's, it's, there's a toolkit. Uh, of how we augment the emotion that an artist gives us in a recording and we bring it fully formed. I mean, that that's really the role of a recording engineer and a record producer is to work with our artists and amplify their goal artistically uh, because we're objective to it uh, oftentimes. And many of you listening might be artists in your own right. But I think you'll all find that it's very difficult to produce yourself. You know, you have an idea you've written a song and because you wrote it you love that song uh you know for better for worse uh you it's very personal to you so to have someone come into the room and say you know doug i really like this thing you're doing 
but honestly, I think it would be better if X happened. And I'm trying to, uh, you know, one of the techniques that I use when when producing an artist is to, is to try to depersonalize the actual music in a way where we're talking about the song in the third person. And that way it doesn't get as defensive when it's like if I tell Doug that I don't like his music, I'm telling Doug that I don't like him. You know, uh, that's that's how it could be read. So uh, outside of the conversation that that we're really going to have today uh, and the example that I brought, I think it, it's worth noting that uh, the process of working in the arts uh, both is not a straight line. It's not always easy. But uh, the effects can be uh, world changing and, uh, in fact, impact many people's lives um, with hearing music that empowers them, inspires them uh, and so forth. So uh, I'm very mindful of the effect of our work and uh, certainly, you know, in protecting artists that I work with. Uh, Doug listed a long laundry list of people that I was very fortunate to work with in Los Angeles. I think anyone would agree that these are all career artists. You know, Bruce Springsteen, Don Henley, Barbara Streisand, Joe Cocker, James Taylor, uh, The Pretenders, The Eurythmics. Uh, many, 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 many artists that I've worked with. At that facility, uh, the clientele was A-list clientele. And, and I say this because... Uh, having 30, 40 years of experience being a craftsperson in the arts, uh, you learn a lot of things. You learn a, a clarity of expression. You learn, um, and this would be certainly true of Bruce Springsteen, one of the greatest storytellers we've ever known. He can really elicit uh, an atmosphere. Uh, he can paint the characters. You know, Bruce is very much like a film director where he's setting the stage out in the, you know, the, out in the West and the dust is coming up from the road and this character is doing something and they're driving someplace. All these touchstones for emotion uh, are very powerful. And Bruce is very skilled in his lyric writing to paint that picture, much like Martin Scorsese and others are as film directors. So when it comes to recording, engineering, and mixing an artist like this, I think you have to reckon certain things up front. Um, first of all, you have, to, you have to have a good musical understanding of what the genre is that you're dealing with. So let's broadly categorize uh, in the example of Bruce Springsteen that he may be doing an Americana, folky, roots, rock amalgam. And if someone gave me those descriptions of a piece of music in that style, it's already starting to, uh, to tell me, you know, what, what things I have to emphasize. If it's rock music, electric guitars are really important to rock music. I think we need to understand how to position them in a mix to give you that emotion of rebellion and uh, that raucous fury that rock music can bring to you. If it's dance music, we're working with a different artist, the agenda is that the listener should wag their head at the right moment and they should dance. They should, uh, they should immediately be able to understand the presentation of the track that moves them in a visceral and a physical way. So it is that specific topic that I think I want to explore a little bit more by playing you uh, a piece of popular music uh, and I'll show you where I got this multi-track recording and you can go get it for yourself if you're interested. Um, and let's just go through a few of the techniques that I use to amplify the emotion of a track. And specifically what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the use of uh, delays to create new rhythms in the recording. So in other words, the drums, the percussion, all play a rhythm, but by the imposition of delays, which I'm gonna talk about what those are and how you figure out how to time them, um, I can substantially change the, uh, the primal motion or the rhythm of a recording uh, at the mix stage, something that the creator didn't set out to do, but I can amplify their intention by a few simple uh, techniques, and I want to, uh, I'll use that as the basis of our discussion today. Uh, mixing is a very vast, complicated uh, art form with a lot of deep science behind it. And uh, at Berklee College of Music, we, uh, we value uh, 
the discipline of mixing so much that we require multiple levels over the course of years for you to go through different modalities of toolkits and uh, intention, but always with an eye towards supporting whatever the artist's goal was. There's, a, uh, there's an intent when a singer-songwriter gives you a track, and you need to figure out how to sharpen the lens, how to sharpen the focus on that to give it its best presentation. So it's a, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, many professionals become mix engineers as a specialty. And I love mixing. I think it's thrilling. And we can present a song in a number of different ways. But uh, in the grand scheme of recording and production, frankly, I like the first part, which is getting in a room with 10 people, horns, rhythm section, vocalists, background vocalists, the whole thing. I enjoy recording live musicians. And of course, in the Corona era, this is uh, like a real bitter pill for me to swallow that I'm doing Zoom events now and I can't be in, in a beautiful studio with you uh, recording a live grouping of musicians. But I, I, I personally find the, the intersection of art and science in the recording studio uh, to be fascinating when I have 10 people in there and our group chemistry is feeding off each other and we're creating a, a, an emotion or a vibe in the room. And my job would be to capture that so that the average listener who heard this has that same experience that we did when we were in the space. And I, I don't know many other art forms that have an exact parallel to this. Uh, you know, obviously painting and sculpture, there's an intent. And when I view, uh, you know, the Mona Lisa, I, I, I feel a certain way, of course. But I just think that music has, is a very powerful tool in that regard. So um, I'm going to show you uh, a multi-track, and I'm going to share with you where I got it from. And uh, Doug, will you be keeping an eye on the chat window in case people are having uh, questions along the way? Absolutely. We, we already have a few, but I think they're kind of general questions that maybe we can talk about at the end. But okay. uh, okay. if uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that for you, definitely. And, okay. Um, Let's moderate that. Okay. As a... Um, pulled out of thin air um, example of a piece of music that I wanted to share with you, I thought I would pick a track that probably many of you might know. And uh, this, I'm going to give you a little lead up here. This was a big hit in 1981. It was a big club dance floor hit. Uh, it was resampled by MC Hammer in 1990, so some nine years after release. Um, this artist became quite wealthy again by having MC Hammer have a hit. And then in the 2000s, uh, it was the entire premise of the movie Little Miss Sunshine, which is one of my favorite left of center uh, movies that, uh, that with Steve Carell and others that was just terrific. And uh, Little Olive, who's the dancer in this, working with her grandpa, uh, featured this song and it was sort of revealed I don't want to give the movie away too much in case you haven't seen it but it it was revealed that it was maybe a little racy a little edgy for a 13 year old Olive uh, to be performing this track so the song I'm speaking of uh, is of course Rick James Super Freak Rick James's Super Freak so let me share a screen I will go to uh, the web page that I got this from and hopefully uh, you can see my browser. Um, mixthemusic.com, mixthemusic.com. This is a commercial service that affords you access to uh, multi-track recordings, the individual elements that went into uh, creating some classic records. And if you look below in the middle of my screen, you'll see everything from Shawn Mendes and The Weeknd uh, to older school Marvin Gaye and Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, um, Robert Palmer, Addicted to Love, another fantastic track, which I almost chose for this. But uh, this service allows you to download the multi-tracks and I'll show you uh, Rick James in a second, and play it in a DAW. Now, what I've realized is that the partnership is with the company called PreSonus, and PreSonus produces a um, DAW, a digital audio workstation, called Studio One. 
And uh, when I went through this process of buying this multi-track, which is $10, by the way, so $9.99, I thought was a tremendous value for being able to get under hood, under the hood with a popular piece of music and explore the elements. I realized that it's knit to a partnership with PreSonus and Studio One. Now, when you buy the multi-track, you can download the demo of this DAW, not one that I'm that familiar with, though I understand they, they use it quite a bit in Europe. Um, and there is a timed demo. There's a 30-day demo. So my guess is on day 31, I lose my access to Super Freak uh, for $10 without buying the full feature DAW, but perhaps I will have had my fill of the track in the next 30 days, and um, we can just chalk it up to, um, to the workshop here. So if there's any questions about that, uh, we can try to answer those offline, but I just wanted to bring to your attention this website, mixthemusic.com, and um, it's fun having access to historical and popular recordings because as a producer, as a musician or a songwriter, you can get under the hood and really take a look at the elements that were used to build the net effect of, of what became a hit record. And if it's a hit record, it means that millions of people have all agreed that this moves them emotionally somehow, uh, even to the point where they put their money down or paid for their Spotify stream and uh, and made this popular and immortal in some way. So this is a really cool website. And uh, if you can get over the fact that you just have a short 30 day download with uh, Studio One, then uh, I would encourage you to explore it. OK, so let's hop out of here and let's go into Studio One. And Doug, if you have any questions uh, or comments along the way, feel free to jump in because I'll just go until you stop me. Uh, Rob, real quick, I did post that uh, URL into the chat so everyone can Great. check that out. Music.com in the chat. Perfect. Uh, can I ask a quick question about that? You said it's nine dollars. Is that a month? No, no, one-time fee. Okay. For you have access to this multi-track. Okay. Now they lock you down in the software that you cannot export the elements into something else outside the ecosystem. Uh, but I thought for ten bucks, getting to see under the hood of Super Freak, you know, was was a good value. And I think any um, beginning mix student who's looking for quality recorded tracks, mm -hmm. that this might be an option to to explore. Uh, because as a, as a student of the craft. Uh, it's a catch-22. We're not working with the best artists in the beginning. Consequently, the songs and the sounds aren't as good. And then as a consequence, it's more difficult for you to mix this because it's not well constructed. That's so I find a lot of value in looking at uh, commercial multitracks uh, when you can get them and, and legally so. So in this case, I can legally play this because I paid for the, uh, the royalty to do that. Fantastic. Okay, let's pull up the screen of Studio One. I'll just keep moving along here. Uh, this is the, uh, the picture of the environment uh, in the digital audio workstation. So let me get this cleaned up for you. Uh, most digital audio workstations are very similar to each other in the types of things that they allow you to do. Uh, for us, and at Berkeley College of Music in music production and engineering, uh, Avid's Pro Tools is the dominant platform of choice. Um, though at Berkeley, because we have content creators and writers and composers, uh, Logic and Ableton are two other platforms that are very, very popular. But I would say all roads ultimately probably lead back to Pro Tools, even if we created uh, hip hop loops in Ableton or FL Studio, Reason, DP, any one of the platforms, nine times out of 10, everything's going to end up in Pro Tools for the final finishing and mix just because the environment is very well tailored to that, um, to that task. Studio One looks like a capable uh, DAW. There weren't a tremendous amount of surprises when I imported the track. Uh, let's look from the top and see the elements that they gave us. Now, I tend to think the original recordings were a little bit more broken out in their elements than what is uh, pre-compiled for you for this download. So in other words, at the top of my screen, I have a track that's just a stereo track that is called drums. That's all the drums, kick, 
snare, hi hat, tom toms, overheads, uh, whatever the drummer may had. Uh, have had in front of him or her, and this has been reduced to a single tr uh, stereo track. So there's not a lot of internal manipulation that I can use. Uh, they've thoughtfully color-coded things, however. If we look at the next track, and this is the one we're going to focus on, the clap track. This is a fairly consistent percussion feature of the song and lends itself uh, quite well for my demonstration of rhythmic delays to create other motion, other subdivisions of the movement of the track. So we're gonna focus on the clap in a minute. You'll also see tambourine and percussion of which there are some uh, specialty sounds and uh, clappers and other, other strange things on the percussion track. Below that in the color code, we see bass, uh, like many DAWs, for some reason, they render this as a stereo track. Uh, I'm highly doubtful there's any stereo information in the bass. It's, it's generally a monophonic uh, instrument, So, but many DAWs spit out stereo even when it's mono. Followed by the green tracks here, um, not all completely divided by color, uh, but the, the first two are electric guitars, and I'm going to solo these. I'll play this track, and we'll walk through some of the elements followed by three tracks of both synthesizer and electric piano. And uh, when we start isolating each group of instruments, you'll quickly see that there's a dialogue, there's a musical communication that happens between the parts. And that is some total what creates the motion in the track. And lastly, at the bottom of my screen, we have the uh, lead vocal, which is Rick James. We'll play that. Again, it is in stereo, but the defense here, uh, my logic uh, says that because we have some ambience, some a little bit of reverb on this, that uh, the reverb is in stereo, but the vocal itself is in mono. It's a monaural source, a single source. And then at the very bottom, we have the backing vocals, the, uh, the background vocals, and they are again in stereo because uh, I believe they truly are two passes of background vocals together. So that's what I, th these are the elements. Uh, we'll play this. If you look at the top of my screen, you see that they've uh, conveniently marked this out into the various musical components. In other words, the form of the song. There's an introduction, there's a verse, a refrain, a pre chorus, chorus, verse, refrain, and solo, right down to the end where there's a saxophone solo in the outro, and that takes us home. So this is a very logical way to lay out the song because I can approach my technology in a musical way. When the producer says to me, can you please play the second verse? I have to know in music terms where the second verse is. And these markers here at the top of my screen really allow me to see the form of the song. So it becomes quite easy. Okay, let me stop talking for a second. Let me just play the track. And uh, hopefully we have our gain structure uh, worked out so that it sounds reasonable on your end. I will freely admit that playing audio through Zoom is like, um, you know, putting a Rodan through a blender. Uh, it, it's, it's fairly well sacrilege because uh, Zoom has a hellacious amount of processing and compression to keep your, uh, your business meeting on track, but it's really not built for playing high density music through. I will say as an aside, and I decided not to do this for this demo, but at Berkeley, we use a tool called Audio Movers. Uh, there's a plugin called Listen To, and Doug, maybe you could find the URL and pop that in the uh, chat. And what Audio Movers does is it allows me to broadcast uh, the output of my DAW straight to a web page that I listen to in a browser window. So it's not compressed, it's better resolution than you're going to get through Zoom. But in the, uh, in the context of our workshop today, that was a little too complicated to have multiple sources. So I didn't share a listen to link, but I, I think you should be aware of the technology because if you're sharing music between yourself and your collaborators, um, popping this plugin on your DAW and broadcasting straight to a web address is a really brilliant way to share better resolution music. Okay, let's play the track. Here we go. Get her off the street, oh girl. She likes the 
So I want you to listen to the sound of this recording. Try to decide how dry, how wet. From the vocal back to the vocals. You see these tracks playing down the bottom? Okay, so I'll stop it there. Rinse and repeat. What a great club track. Uh, you know, really, one of the things that attracted me to using this as a demo is literally from the downbeat, this track is off to the races. There's no long, mopey uh, intro and, uh, you know, winding up into the verse for a good chorus. This is all business right away. And uh, I love that about this song. And that's why it was such a big dance floor hit, because as soon as the DJ would spin this, you're, you're into it for, for nine minutes or whatever the remix was. Um, one of the things I love with commercial multitracks, especially something that you've, you've heard on the radio, you've seen in movies, is being able to look at the vocal, the lead vocal. And I'm just going to solo or isolate um, Rick James's lead vocal here for just a second. She's a very kinky girl, the kind you don't take home to mother. She will never let your spirits down. Once you get her off the street, oh girl. She likes the boys in the band. She says that I'm her all-time favorite. You know, what, what knocks me out, and, and it stands to reason why this resonated with people, there's a lot of emotion in this verse i mean you you hear his voice he's got these little asides he's got some growls and some ad-libs that that uh, show up later in the track and for me uh there is no successful track that features vocals that has a weak vocal in other words all the artists that i've been fortunate to work with at a m that we listed before are incredible signature voices you know, when, when Joe Cocker, while he was alive, uh, or Barbara Streisand, or any of these people, when they open their mouth, instantaneously, it's like, oh, okay, I'm paying attention because you have a quality of your voice that is uh, very interesting to me. So I love being able to go into the track and isolate the elements, especially with the vocals, and hear uh, what that performance sounded like. You know, Rob, you were talking about storytelling, too. And, you know, obviously the vocal is perfectly recorded. There's a wonderful, nice sort of ambience delay, sort of short delay on there to kind of spread it out. Uh, and it has some stereo material. But just the storytelling that's going on in the way he's presenting the lyrics, it, we start to get a sense of maybe the narrator is a bit flawed in some way or has... Clearly, <laughs> if you read his history, <laughs> yes. whatever happened to Rick James, but yeah, sure. Right. So I think that goes to what you were saying about sort of the, the storytelling that a, a great singer, you know, not only is it a great recordings, but they reveal some of the storytelling that the artists uh, employ. Absolutely. It's a great point, Doug. And I think just um, the conviction uh, of how a vocalist embraces their character. I mean, these are characters. E everyone who sings a song becomes that character for four minutes. And within that character, there's a backdrop and there's a backstory and tension and release and all the journalistic uh, uh, tools that we learn about in writing. Uh, that's that's embodied in a great lead vocal. Um, I mentioned earlier, because I know that our time is relatively short here, that um, we need to understand musical genres to decide what is, quote, uh, in the norm for that genre. What I mean by that is this song came out in 1981. It was a dance hit. And coming out of the disco era, I'm thinking about the drums in specific. Let me play the drums, uh, the, the percussion track here, including the claps, but uh, drum set only and percussion. You can see what's soloed here. Let me just play this for a second. Okay, listen to the drum set.
That drum set is recorded in the driest, least reflective space absolutely possible. This sounds like inside my closet. There is no sensation that the drums are in a room of any size. We can't discern what the space sounds like. Uh, even you can see my backdrop. I'm in a fairly large space above my garage where my studio is. Just the ambience of my voice in this space, I hear it when I talk. But when we listen to that drum recording, it is absolutely bone dry. And that was a stylistic um, norm of the disco era to have a lot of impact, not to be diluted by room sound, but to have a lot of impact of the rhythm to make people dance at Studio 54. You know, to make you move in a club, the drums are purposefully as dry and as present as possible. Now the claps, and we're gonna get into our uh, time delays here with the claps. The claps have a built-in reverb. There's a built-in ambience to them. Listen to them. Okay, hearing that ambience, if my eyes were closed, I would say this could be in a bathroom. This sounds like a bright, not that large, hard surfaced, perhaps tiled. The claps could have been recorded in a bathroom if this was the ambience that was on them. Now we could impose this ambience through the use of effects post facto. It could have been recorded dry and we could have added that sound. But to me, this sounds like the claps are done in a bathroom. And uh, that may have been the case. We're always looking for uh, unique environments to be able to uh, record music so that they have a, uh, an identity in the mix and these Claps have their own identity, very different than when I list claps. Also, in fact, throw the bass. What a hook! This bass line, classic hook. That is the hook of the song. You know, as, as well as the lyric refrain. But when you hear this, this is why MC Hammer stole this for "You Can't Touch This," because it's the perfect loop of bass and drums. Okay, let's get into some time delays. You've, you've been hearing the rhythm. You see how it works in the track. Let me show you, and I'll share a different screen, um, how I figure out musical delays that relate to the tempo of this song. So let me share you a different screen. Uh, let's see, too many choices. You know, Zoom is funny. I have Windows open that's not showing me as a choice. I mean, they, they do have my desktop, so let me, uh, let me just go to that instead. Perhaps that's easier. I think if you just share the desktop, it'll share. That's probably you. better. Okay, inside this, uh, this keynote window, I have the picture of a screenshot from an application that I have on my iPhone. This is called Music Math. Doug, that's another good one. Maybe we could find that uh, iOS link for the chat. Music Math is an iOS uh, uh, application that allows me to convert a tempo. And if I know the tempo, I can enter the tempo. And in the case of Super Freak, the tempo is 132 beats per minute. The software told me that. If I did not know the tempo, they have a tap feature which allows me to tap my space bar in time with the, the groove and it interpolates what tempo or speed the track is. The interesting thing is once I know this tempo of how many beats are in a minute, if we look at the left side here, you see musical note values, whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, 16th, 32nd, 64th, and so forth. and all of the standard musical variants for timing, a dotted quarter note, a dotted eighth note, a triplet eighth note. So if you're a study uh, of music and you understand um, you know, how beats are divided, this is an essential tool, being able to talk in musical terms, and then you look in the middle column and it translates the length of time it, it takes to create one musical note interval. So in the case of a quarter note, our standard pulse, 
132 beats per minute. The quarter note takes 454.55 milliseconds between hits. That's almost a half a second. You can get to very rough math if you use 120 beats per minute because this becomes 500 milliseconds. This is a very easy reference that you could calculate in your mind on the fly. But for 132, I have very specific note values, musical note values, translated into their timing equivalent. Okay, now why is this important? Let's go back to the Studio One multitrack and let's open up uh, the view of the console. So here's some faders. This makes me feel comfortable. Uh, this is my wheelhouse here. And on the claps, I'm using a plugin from uh, the manufacturer called Sound Toys. Uh, and specifically, this is the Echo Boy analog echo processor. So it's a delay plugin. And Sound Toys, what a wonderful company they are. They make very stylized um, plugins. In other words, it's not just your meat and potatoes of EQs and compressors, but it's a lot of color stuff. Uh, distortions and uh, pitch shifters and delays in this case. So I'm a huge fan of Sound Toys. Uh, again, Doug, maybe a great uh, extra link to throw in soundtoys.com. I, I know people could find that easily. But um, the beauty of this plugin is that when you look in the center, because this is a, um, a session in Studio One, it already knew that my tempo for this track in round terms was 132 beats per minute. It's almost 133, but I used 132 because it does fluctuate. And I have to make a note here that given the era, this is not a drum machine playing this. This is a human being perhaps playing with a metronome in his or her headphones, but this is a human playing music for a nine minute dance track. And consequently, the tempo is going to fluctuate slightly. Okay, without going too far off the rails, let's play the clap and let me add on an eighth note delay and let's listen to how the sound or the rhythm or the feeling of the clap changes when I introduce a time delay that's in time with the tempo of the track. Here we go. Solo the claps. And only the claps. Let's introduce this delay. Da-da, da-da, off. eighth note. So without any heavy lifting on my part, this plugin speaks musical note values. It knew the tempo. I didn't even have to calculate it. And I said an eighth note, and let's listen to the, this, the change of the rhythm. Now, let's change the rhythm again by choosing a dotted eighth note, which if you know music, it means an eighth note plus a sixteenth note. It's half of the original value added on to the length. Gotcha, gotcha. There's a different kind of rhythm. Okay, I'll start from the top. The dot the extra 16th note in the delay value produces a different effect into the track. And let's take a look at triplets. Da da, da da, da da da, da da da, triple it, triple it. I'll spin up some feedback here, which means I'm recirculating the sound back into itself, and you'll see the net effect here. Da da da, da da da. I'll do this to the dot. Cha, 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 cha. Or the straight eighth note. So the feedback control is very useful in extending the length of this delay effect that I'm creating. And why don't I put this back in the track and I'll cycle through a few of these variations so that you can hear the net effect on the music when we hear the delay introduced on top of the original rhythm. Go to the top. Take it off. It 
has a whole other swagger when I introduce this on the clap. Without it. Now, I think that's a pretty interesting phenomenon. So what I'm able to do is introduce a new musical element on top of what was given me. No one gave me this rhythm, but I was able to devise this extra rhythm by the timed calculation of delays on a rhythmic part that's already in the recording. Now, maybe what would be exciting is if I only introduced this effect in the chorus or in a second verse, something that allows me to create further motion and interest in the recording because things are changing, things are developing. And I think that in, especially in this world of uh, streams and sound bites and Twitter, 140 characters, our attention span has grown to be very, very short. And as a music mixer, I'm always cognizant about losing my audience because things get boring. Now, when you work with a great songwriter and a great arranger, they've They've done the job about making the track interesting. But as a mixer, I need to continue to look for other ways to amplify the interest factor, to make the thing grow, make the song grow at various points to give the listener some sensation of forward movement in, in the experience. So if I were to play the song from the refrain here, uh, let's see, and then maybe in the chorus uh, coming up, I'll introduce the delay. You can see what I'm talking about. Okay, we've got a change coming up at the pre-chorus, maybe something here. Little less obvious there. Let's see the chorus. That's kind of cool. I'll take it off. That, that clearly works for me. I mean, obviously, the, the song has a build of its own there, but I'm a drummer. Full disclosure, I'm a drummer. And so um, a, a lot of how I look at a mix is from that perspective of sitting in the rhythm section my whole life as an instrumentalist. And understanding what the function of bass and drums and the rhythm section is in the song. And especially from a percussive standpoint, um, I use this as a signature in, in my mixes, many mixers do of course, um, as a way to just augment the groove. The deeper the groove, the more people do this. They wag their head and they, they dance and they get wild all at the right time. And quite frankly, when I'm, when I'm mixing, I love it when the uh, FedEx person arrives uh, at, the, at the edge of the door. And I see out of the corner of my eye that a stranger has just walked into my mix and uh, my music is playing, and I'm not going to stop because I'm in my thing. But uh, out of the corner of my eye, I'm watching the person standing there with the package to see how they move, how they react. If they start going like this while they're waiting for me to finish, I'm, I'm taking note of that, thinking, okay, what I'm doing is actually having an emotional effect on a total stranger who just opened the door, walked into my space, and now I am moving them physically, and they can't resist it. They start wagging their head. They start shuffling their feet. I think that's a huge barometer in your success of how well you're doing as a mixer. Well, Rob, that really brings up, I have a question, and, and as we kind of segue into some Q&A things yep. here, um, when is, and there's a bunch of questions that people have asked here, so I, I do want to get to those. Yes. Um, but a quick question is, so when is too far? When, when, when have you gone too far? You know, so this is great. You're augmenting sort of a part that maybe only you and I are really listening to, or the drummer is listening to. Uh, the average listener is probably focused on what Rick James has to say. Right. So, but when is using these sort of time-based effects to elicit emotion, when it, what, what's a faux pas? What is too far? Well, um, I have some other examples uh, quickly set up with the with the lead vocal, with the saxophone, other elements in this track, and and too far might be imposing this same technique all over the place and causing confusion, sure. uh, especially if we have multiple rhythms being presented. You you said a very important thing. 
the average person is listening to what Rick James is saying. Mm -hmm. the, the person on the street couldn't pick out a bass drum, perhaps, if their life depended on it. They, they, they can't discern to understand all the elements that go into a finished mix because it's very complicated. But the goal here is that whatever Rick James is singing about, whatever story Bruce Springsteen is telling, never shall I intrude on that space. When we could think of it, when you go to a live concert, remember those, where the spotlight would come on and focus on the lead singer, and all eyes in the arena would turn to them and they watch them. Then the guitar solo happens, and the pyro goes off, and they swing the light over to the left on the guitar player, so that the audience knows where to look and listen to. This is the same phenomena in a recorded mix. I need to lead you into thinking about what you're supposed to be thinking about, which is Rick James's story. Yeah. But this is a dance record. And right. so this record needs to move from the bottom. So there's twin goals here of making this move effectively and tapping into the, the human aspect mm -hmm. through my use of tools, at the same time not losing the story. You know, and it's funny, and you say that, that they wouldn't, maybe the average listener wouldn't be able to distinguish between maybe a kick and a snare or something like that, but they know when it's wrong. Absolutely, you know when it's wrong. And you would know if I uh, tried to mix this like a country record <laughs> or a contemporary Christian project. Well, first of all, Rick James would never be allowed in that. <laughs> probably camp. not, probably not. <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is that different genres have different conventions. And we need to understand by looking at the charts, looking at what's popular. It's not to say we can't do something different and be different and be individual, but but quite frankly, in the old days, if Tower Records didn't know what bin to put your record in, blues, country, gospel, rock, folk, then your record was nowhere and you couldn't find it because they couldn't categorize it broadly. So understanding the, the, that reality also means that I need to understand the mechanics of how these songs are built in a particular genre. And that is a... Uh, an indicator for me of when I may have gone too far. We have to be objective, uh, you know, of, of when you should stop futzing around and just be done. Sure. And many people, many mixers say that we're done when the money runs out. Yeah, or when the deadline happens. Yeah, yeah. or the deadline or the next session is coming in at three o'clock. Sure. Yeah. Okay, our session is short, and this is a this is a topic I could speak for four hours at a clip sure. on. But let's get to our let's get to our questions and see if we can answer any of those. Great. Um, so we do have a few questions here. Um, I also know there are some students here. I see uh, Sam Rosario is here. So uh, I don't know if uh, Sam has any questions, but um, I will start here. Uh, I believe this is, I'm not sure who this question is from, but it said, how might you approach a mix in the box to give each element its own form of clarity in the mix? I mean, talk about something you could talk about for an hour, right? <laughs> yeah, well, let me, let me give you a little... Um, a little guidance that I learned early on from some really fantastic mixers. Uh, Bob Clearmountain, if that name is familiar to a study of engineers, probably the most famous mix engineer there ever was. Uh, you can Google him and look at his work. And I worked with Bob for years and understood how he built a mix. I would say uh, the, the question is really a slightly different question, and that is, where do I start? Yep. And for me, I start with the vocal. Like it's the very first fader I physically put up is the vocal. And I might set that fader to zero in the workstation. I might make some guesses about an ambience that needs to go around it, but I'm going to refine that choice later. Um, and then when I have the vocal at the top of the pyramid, then I start to balance in all the other instruments behind it. The old school thinking was we start at the left side of the console with drums. Yeah. Now, I'm a drummer. I always started there. And my wife, even when we were dating, would say, the drums are too loud. Mm -hmm. like, How's that possible? How could drums be too loud? <laughs> but honestly, by the time I got to the vocal, I built the rhythm section so large, I couldn't get the vocal over with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that the way to get clarity in my workstation mixes is to start with the most important element, and that is the character and the story. And quite often, the lead vocalist is the person with their face on the cover. They are the artist, principally. Yeah. And if I start with that and then balance my other instruments underneath it, being careful never to cover the vocal where I can't understand what they're saying, mm -hmm. 
then that's a successful geometry. And I call it the pyramid of importance. At the top of the pyramid is the lyric element. It's usually the vocal. If we're making a Kenny G saxophone record, mm -hmm. Kenny G is a soprano sax player and part owner of Starbucks, by the way. Um, then that lyrical element is the most important element in the mix. And I put the saxophone up first and I balance underneath that. So I would say uh, start with the most important element and bring things in so that you can feel them and they're, uh, they're making their statement, but don't cover over, uh, uh, over the vocal or whatever the lyric element is. And there's some of that in the Rick James track where, where you, have, you have this really great groove that's important, but then what brings sort of the uniqueness to the song is this sort of over the top lyrics. And so the fact that you can hear kind of both, you know, and, the, and the both have s some priority, um, is probably why we're still talking about that track, right? In, uh, exactly. in 2020. <laughs> and to that point, Doug, look at the simplicity of the recording overall. Mm -hmm. You know, this may have been combined from the original recording for the purpose of download, but fundamentally, we only have a handful of elements here. There's not a hundred tracks in this record. Sure. And uh, I think if you reverse engineer the classic albums that you love, the arrangement was so skillful and so directed that that's why it endures the test of time. So it, that's a whole other workshop. Maybe we'll get to do that one. Yeah, um, other questions? Yeah, so here is, um, oh, uh, Sam, do you have a, Sam's live here. Sam, do you have a, a question for us live here? Yeah, she did. Actually, it was my question when I wrote when I was VP. Hey, so, hey uh, Sam, do me a favor. Turn your game sorry. down on your mic a little bit. You're coming in a little hot. Here it is. Is that, is that better? Is yeah, a little, little less, a okay. little less, a little less. Okay, I was just hoping. Perfect. There you go. There's yeah. that great voice. <laughs> I love that. Um, anyway, well, that was my question that I chose when I RSVP'd last night. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate the help. I've been thinking about, like, when building multiple tracks, like, how do you get that almost analog sense of clarity? I know some people use, like, analog processors, and they work outside of the box, but I know it comes back to that simple sense of just gain staging. So... Gate staging and balance, you know, balance and panning. Before I attack equalization, compression, plugins, any other melodyne, fixing pitch, the very first thing I do is I try to get a solid musical balance. You know, the job used to be called a balance engineer. Mm -hmm. And I really love that credit. That's what it's all about. Put the vocal, whether you're mixing a young nudie track or you know, who, whoever the artist is, right? The story has to get through first. And then in hip hop, of course, an enormous 808 low end, just massive. And we do need special techniques. Doug, you're gonna work with Prince Charles Alexander. He's a master of this. But understanding how to build the low end in a hip hop record and yet be able to hear the rap on top, that's a, that's a construction, that's a trick. Absolutely. But, um, it really comes down to balance first. And then when I've done my balance and some basic ideas about panning, then I'm gonna move on to sharpening up the details, perhaps with effects, EQ, compression, and other things. It's not where I start. And I would encourage you to be a good balance engineer first. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna require that you listen on your headphones, what you're wearing, you need some small speakers, you need a, a couple different ways to audition your work to see if that emotion is getting through. Sounds good. Awesome. Um, are there, thanks Sam. And I could, I, I didn't want to point you out, but I'm pretty sure that was your question. Those were your two questions. They, they sounded very Sam, Sam like, great questions. Um, let's see, uh, are there any other live questions? Uh, we're, we're about out of time here. We're coming towards the end. Is there any sort of last minute question that uh, anyone, anybody wanted to ask uh, that's here live with us? Well, um, why don't we do this then, if, if there's no one here. Uh, there's one last question, and I, I think it, it's sort of a nice round out question. Um, it, it's talking about the ease at which to elicit either positive emotions or negative emotions uh, within music, and are they equal? And I, I guess I, I'm curious about that question, because what's, you know, why would you elicit a negative emotion? Or, or, or maybe you can elaborate on that, Rob. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, a different demo that I could have wound up would have been uh, a different direction where I'm creating uh, anger and fury and rebellion and, and sure. protest yeah. out of music. And uh, we're going to do that by treating the sounds in a slightly different way. We, I, I would employ the tool of distortion. You know, a recording engineer's job seems to be to record everything beautifully and clean. But in fact, uh, to make a very angry, punk, rebellious sound, I, I need things to be crunchy and distorted and on overload and in your face so that when you hear it, you're like, ooh, that, it causes me some tension just to hear that sound because, you know, it, it's been brutalized in a fashion. Yeah. And that's a very specific technique, um, as well as the polar opposite of having something that's very lonely feeling, yeah. mournful, expansive, lots of ambience. You're in the moors of Scotland at dawn in November, and you're painting a picture. Mm -hmm. And um, through the use of reverb and balance and tonality, I can create a very expansive, mournful, melancholy feeling. So we have projects at Berkeley called Soundalikes that we require our students to do. Honestly, I like calling them feel-alikes better because yeah. it needs to evoke the same emotion, and yet there's a toolkit to get there. So I think we can, we can push the button on any emotion, and there is a toolkit behind uh, that choice. Wow. Well, uh, Rob, this has been amazing. Um, it's, it's great to listen to this track. I haven't heard this track in years. And certainly I've never soloed even just the raw vocals. Uh, so it was amazing to hear that. Um, it was also amazing to hear you talk. And um, it's, it's really just that you're, you can tell your passion for this, like why you've been so successful in your career and, and even where you are in your career now, just the, the amount of passion you have for this thing that some people maybe trivialize. And, and you have this real passion for it. And uh, I think you're in the right place at a, at a talk like this because you have a lot of people who are, who are also really excited about it. Well, thanks. Um, so, so they did tell us to wrap up here, but... Um, Coming up on two, uh, I see some students here. Uh, first of all, you're not my students, but you are now, and I miss my students. I miss all of you, and, and uh, as you say, Doug, I'm an evangelist uh, and fierce protector of the craft as the craft has moved into a lot of different modalities. And uh, working at home is no less uh, real than working at Abbey Road in London, although I like working at Abbey Road in London. That's a very special experience, of course. Uh, but I would say, you know, in this corona time, let's let's be creative. Let's find our vibe. Let's learn how to collaborate with people at a distance. And if it means you've got a FaceTime window open and a Zoom and a DAW through uh, audio movers going, Man, let's do that. Let, let's let's uh, come out with our reaction to our COVID lockdown in art and see what that looks like in the future. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I love talking about this stuff. I'll be happy to do something different for you all in the future if you want to. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see each other on Mass Ave and Huntington Ave uh, you know, in September or sometime real soon. But thank you again for having me. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Rob. Thanks to everyone else who came as well, and thanks for the questions that were shared. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. I enjoyed yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.